And now for something completely different. Ah! Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And welcome to the show this morning. Of course, it is Thursday. It's not only the second best day of the week because tomorrow's Friday, but it's also second best day of the week before Christmas, which makes it even better. This is like a special Thursday edition of the Real Investment Show, which, I mean, we would be remiss not to screw the entire show up by having Michael Leibowitz here. So he, he will be here this morning. The Grinch himself will be here. He'll, he'll want to rain on your parade about the whole market thing, and it's all going to crash next year. You know, he's, he's always super bearish. So anyway, we got a lot of stuff to get into this morning. Part of it being the Super Bowl indicator. You know, it's this time of year where we start putting together New Year's resolutions and we start talking about the, the various indicators for what next year will bring, right? So if we have a Santa Claus, if, if Santa Claus fails to visit Broad and Wall, right? In other words, we don't have a Santa Claus rally. Well, that's not good for the stock market next year. If we don't have the positive first five days of January, so goes the first five days of January, so goes the month, that suggests a bad year. And of course, if January is bad, then we have a bad year because January sets the tone for the year. And then of course, you have a whole variety of other ones like did it rain on the 4th of May last year, and things like that. But the Super Bowl indicator being another one of those, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. Uh, Mike had a really good article out yesterday talking about the bandwagon effect. So we'll, we'll talk about that this morning. But the Super Bowl indicator is one of those indicators that people look at, right? Because if the AFC wins, then the stock market's supposed to be have, have a bad year. If the NFC wins, then it's a good year. So I don't know who you're rooting for for the Super Bowl this year, but it may have an impact on the market. It's totally coincidental, <laughs> but you know, there's the old saying about causation and correlation and not necessarily the same thing. This may be one of those. What the Super Bowl has to do with the market outcome for the year, more coincidence than not. But we'll talk about this uh, that, uh, with Michael Leibowitz early, uh, later on this morning because, again, you know, as we start talking about what led last year or this year, right, in 2023, who's going to win next year? Right? It's going to be something entirely different. So we'll get into that this morning. Um, outside of that, you know, we'll talk about the sell-off here in just a second yesterday, kind of what drove that, and that was kind of an interesting thing. But as we start to you know, kind of get in towards the beginning of next year, it's, it's kind of an interesting dichotomy of things that are going on that um, somebody's going to be wrong on next year. Um, whatever it is, we'll see. Economic data is improving. Uh, consumer confidence was up sharply yesterday, and that's not surprising given this recent rally in the market. As we've talked about before, you know, one of the Fed's problems is that a stock market rally reduces financial tightness. In other words, it makes, it makes people feel better, right, because the markets are going up. Yields are coming down rather sharply, which is easing the cost of financing. That's now feeding into consumer confidence, and the problem with that is, is they go out and spend money. Right? They, they go out and borrow money, they go out and spend money, whatever it is, uh, because they feel better. That potentially increases economic activity, which is not really what the Fed wants because that's inflationary, right? More act economic activity you have, the more inflationary pressures you're going to have, or at least a, sustain uh, a, sust a sustainment of the current rate of inflation, right? The, uh, we're currently running about 3% inflation, the Fed wants it down to 2 and if you get enough economic activity, that's going to make that a little bit more difficult. Um, ISM Manufacturing Index has been improving uh, as of late, so we're starting to see those recover. Seeing a lot of our economic data uh, starting to recover. The leading economic indicators have bottomed and started to turn up. Um, we're starting to see a lot of our economic composites beginning to, to bottom and turn up. So economic activity is improving. And that's problematic for the Fed because, again, that's not what the Fed wants. The Fed kind of wants this almost a recession type scenario. They wouldn't even mind a very mild recession to bring to make sure that inflation comes down. So one of the big challenges for the Fed next year is going to be this whole idea of rate cuts. And interestingly enough, the market is already pricing in six rate cuts next year, even though the Fed has only pr uh, projected three. And now we've got uh, Fed officials coming out starting to try to backpedal 
on the whole recent announcement by the Fed saying, well, you know, we talked about it, but really not really. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. But again, the Fed's about to run into a bit of trouble here in terms of, you know, what's happening with the economic data. And potentially if we see an uptick in inflation, that's going to be very problematic for the Fed and maybe problematic for the markets early next year. We'll see. I mean, there's, there's so many things that are going on. We'll find out. Okay, here's what you need to know before the bell this morning. Markets sold off, and it's funny, this morning the headlines everywhere, worse sell-off since September, right? We haven't had a down day in like weeks, <laughs> so, you know, a bit of a down day was certainly not, was not only not surprising yesterday, but long overdue. We've been talking about having a bit of a correction in the markets because we've gotten very, very overbought on a short-term basis. That occurred yesterday. Uh, lots of, you know, everybody was trying to figure it out. What caused it? You know, what, what you know, there's, there's no news out there. What caused this big sell-off? And, and sometimes you really don't need a reason. You just need somebody to go, I'm out. And then, and then once somebody starts selling, then you get more people start selling, and then it kind of turns into a stampede for the day. Um, and that's, that's really kind of what happened. Market was up yesterday morning, coming out of the gate. We were up for a, a couple of days, a couple hours. And then uh, it was gone in 120 minutes as the, uh, a little bit longer than the movie, but uh, in 120 minutes, we wiped out an entire week's worth of gains. So, you know, pretty impressive sell-off yesterday. Um, we did bring down some of that overbought condition in the markets. Haven't triggered a sell signal yet from these very high levels, but we'll, we'll see what happens over the next uh, day or so. Um, we are, you know, again, no real risk here at this point in terms of the markets. Again, a healthy correction was needed um, as we've just come so far so quickly, really, since November without really much of a break along that way. You know, we talked about buying stampedes the other day, and this buying stampede is very, very long in the tooth. So, again, a, a correction yesterday, not surprising this morning. Futures are looking to try to point up. That's also not surprising. We've got a lot of FOMO in the markets right now. So, there's been a lot of people just you know, kind of looking for any opportunity to, to try to put some money to work. So again, with that sell-off yesterday, not surprising people are kind of jumping in this morning like, oh, this, this is my shot for the Santa Claus rally. I got to get some money to put to work. And, and so again, that's not going to be really surprising. We're heading the last week of the year. You're going to have portfolio window dressing. So you know, yesterday may be a one-day decline. We may get a little bit of bounce today, say maybe some more sell-off potentially today or tomorrow as we head into the Christmas holiday. But again, we do have that last five days of the year and the first two days of January right around the corner. Portfolio dressing for portfolio managers, rebalancing for the end of the year. So there is a, a potential that whatever little pullback we get momentarily is going to be short-lived uh, until we get through the first couple of days of January. Then we'll figure out what happens uh, from that point. But again, nothing really yesterday of consequence that sends off alarm bells. It was just a very much needed healthy correction in the markets. And again, one day doesn't really mean anything, but it was kind of interesting because there really was no news. It just kind of showed up out of nowhere and really sent, you know, por portfolio managers and the media and everybody else kind of scrambling to find a reason, but there was really no reason out there. Um, you know, if you wanted to point to a reason, maybe it was FedEx yesterday. FedEx had a very poor announcement big hit to revenue, that stock was down 12%. So maybe you could say, well, it was FedEx and the markets figured out that maybe the economy is not as strong as expected. I wouldn't, I wouldn't build too much into the FedEx story. Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence elsewhere that the economy is doing just fine. Uh, this is probably something specific to FedEx, competition with Amazon and UPS, et cetera. So again, don't read too much into FedEx as the economic indicator that's telling us a recession is about to come that's probably not the case considering again what's happening with a lot of the other economic data so again probably just a short-term sell-off here we'll see what happens we'll keep you up to date of course as always here on before the bell but that's what you need to know this morning when we come back we will pick up with michael Ebowitz and we'll talk about the bandwagon effect don't go away
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Coming up January the 27th, we're having a special event. It's called Navigating the Markets in a Presidential Cycle. Greg Vallier is coming to be the keynote presentation. Adam Taggart will be there. Michael Leibowitz, myself, will be spending the morning talking about the economy, the markets, presidential election cycles, what to expect. Tickets are on sale right now. Early bird registration on the website. If you go to Real investmentadvice.com. Click on the banner at the top. Tickets are $99. We've got very limited seating at Hotel Sinesta here in Houston. Uh, you get your early bird special now. Ticket prices will go up as we get into early January. Get your tickets now on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. Have the market's gyrations made you nervous? If so, it's because you have more risk in your portfolio than you realize. It's time to reevaluate your long-term investing strategy with RIA advisors. Our disciplined approach can help eliminate unnecessary risk. We do that by having both a buy and sell discipline. Does your advisor do that? If you think it's time to work with an advisor who puts your interests first, it's time for real investment advice. RIA Advisors, 855-RIA-PLAN, riaadvisors.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. So this morning, it is, of course, the pre-Christmas edition of the Real Investment Show. Michael Leibowitz joining me this morning. So a few things to get into. Um, he wrote an interesting article out yesterday that's on the website talking about the, the bandwagon effect. And again, kind of the MAG-7 have been the story this year, the Magnificent 7. And it's interesting now, I, I saw a chart out this morning Um Guy who's trying to make things like everybody's claiming this year's rally is just the Magnificent Seven, but take a look at this chart, which was a chart of the S and P 500 Equal Weighted Index, which has done a record, just a massive reversal. It, just 33 days ago, I want you to listen to this because this is important. Just 33 days ago, that index was trading at a 52-week low. 33 days later, it's a 52-week high. Now, his premise is that that massive rally to a 52-week high in the S&P 500 equal, uh, equal weighted index is clear evidence that, you know, this is not just a MAG-7 rally. And that's a fair statement, right? Over the course of the last 33 days, this rally has definitely broadened out. It's been a chase for everything. Um, by the way, the NASDAQ, right, is up about 53%. Well, this was as of, what's today, Thursday? This is as of Tuesday's close, right? So I was doing this math yesterday uh, while the market was process of selling off. So bear with me on the numbers for a second. But the NASDAQ was up 53% for the year at the time I was doing this. Now, ARK Investments, this is Kathy Wood's um, ETF, right, of these disruptor stocks, which most of them are fundamentally broke companies. <laughs> they're, they're fundamentally very weak. Now, there's a couple of winners in there, you know, like Tesla, but... Most of these are, are, are very, very small companies and, and have not done well. Well, just 33 days ago, that ETF was trading at a 52-week low. It's up 57% in 33 days. It's actually outpaced the NASDAQ on a year-to-date basis just over the last month. 
So this has been a chase, uh, kind of the dash for trash, show, so to speak, just over the last 33 days. The, the, the important part about this, though, is that, yes, the, the rally has indeed broadened out over the last 33 days as everybody's chasing everything at the moment. But the S&P 500, as a function, is up 23% year to date. The RSP is up about 11%. Again, this was before yesterday's sell-off, so again, just bear with me on the numbers. But the S&P is still up twice as much as the index that still contains the Magnificent 7. Now, remember, <laughs> the Magnificent 7 isn't excluded from the S&P 500 equal weighted index. They just have a less weight in that index. So again, you can look at that index and say it does give you a fair representation of what the rest of the market is doing. But the S&P is still up twice as much. As everything else, so this is in, has has indeed been a year where you can say seven stocks drove the market at the headline. And if you didn't own the seven, you didn't perform well this year. And there's going to be a lot of, look, and this is, here's the important thing, and then I want to throw this over to Mike. But this is the time of the year now where everybody starts looking at their year-to-date performance. Well, how did I do this year relative to the market, right? And that's a terrible way to, to measure your performance because you're not the market. But if you had a diversified portfolio of any type, if you owned your your if you owned international and emerging market stocks, you're in worse shape. So if you had a diversified portfolio, you did not pace the market this year. The only way you paced the market this year was to either own the index directly or own seven stocks, right? And nobody's nobody's actually going to do that with all of their money, especially with all the other headlines that are out there. So again, you know, as you start to to get into the end of this year and start thinking about next year, this is where people make the most of their mistakes. We talk about comparison is the worst thing that you can do. You know, chasing a benchmark index is always going to put you on the wrong side of the trade. And, and this is the point of Mike's article, which was very good, by, uh, by the way, Mike, is talking about this uh, bandwagon effect. And uh, if, you, if you get a chance and you want to go uh, read the article, I know, you know, TLDR, I get it, too long, did not read. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you want to read the article, it's, it is on the website right now under our blog section. Uh, but, Mike, this, this idea that we're talking about here with the Magnificent Seven and, and, you know, as we start looking into next year, what was some of your kind of your, your takeaway on, on this? The, 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 it was kind of a, uh, a, a look at our biases. And, you know, we have a lot of investment biases and things that can really send us down the wrong road. Uh, and it was actually a couple weeks ago, my Washington commanders were playing the Dolphins and the game was in D.C. And I, it must have been at least half the crowd, if not two thirds, had Dolphins jerseys on. And I get it if it's like the Eagles or Giants because they're relatively close and they have a lot of fans that live in the D.C. area. Or if it's someone like the 49ers or Cowboys who are just perennial good and they have fans everywhere. But this was the Dolphins who are very good this year, but they really haven't been good in a long time. So, you know, it led me to think, well, probably a lot of those fans are front runners. I doubt that that many people flew from <laughs> Miami to D.C. You know, if you're going to fly from Miami, you're going to see a better team than the commanders. You're not going <laughs> to spend all that money and aggravation to watch the commanders play watch your Dolphins play the commander. So it led me to believe that a lot of people are jumping on the Dolphins bandwagon. And that happens every, that happens in sports all the time, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the new hot team um, draws the fans. It also happens in investing, right? The Magnificent Seven this year was the it theme. Seven stocks were, is what drove the market. Lance, you gave out those statistics earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to the last 33 days, it's just amazing the outperformance. Some of it is kind of changed over the last 33 days, but still, you know, 53 percent for the uh, you know again through yesterday or two days ago for the Nasdaq versus 11 percent for the RSP is just grossly off sides. And again, you know, people latched on to the idea of the Magnificent Seven, and we've seen this this kind of bandwagon effect grow. This, this effect has grown over the last five years. You know, we call it FOMO. Uh, we saw with ARC, you mentioned ARC, but ARC was the hottest thing in what, in 2020, 
20, late early 21. Yep. You couldn't, people couldn't buy enough ARC and all these companies, like you said, that are kind of partially on their way to default. Um, so the article is basically understand what you own, understand what's driving the market, but also understand that it's pretty rare that one theme dominates year to year. You know, so if you look at Super Bowl champions, it's rare where there's a, a repeating champion. And, you know, there's actually a picture of all the helmets of all the teams and all the Super Bowls. And you don't see you see some teams that, that show up a lot. The Steelers, the 49ers, the Cowboys. But you don't see repeating champions, <laughs> just like in a stock market. You don't see repeating themes very often or even in the asset markets. You know, technology stocks will do great one year. They tend to be middle of the road next year. Bonds did bad last year. They tend to rise to the top, you know, in the year ahead. You know, commodities, gold, oil, uh, sectors, uh, factor themes, they all tend to rotate in and out of favor. So, you know, diversification has been an awful strategy this year, as much as it may make sense. But if you look at a portfolio over a few years, my guess is that diversification will have made a lot of sense, that you will have had some of the Magnificent Seven, but you will have whatever comes into favor next year. And I'm actually, for, uh, I guess, two weeks, I'm putting out an article on what that may be, what sectors may lead the way. And we, we look at expected earnings growth and valuations um, to help us to guide us as to what what may be the hot sector. And Lance, question for you. Mm -hmm. Do you know which is on an earnings perspective, which uh, sector is going to grow the most expected to grow the most most next year? Technology. Nope. No, really? What? Healthcare. Uh, yep, this is true. Yeah, Health negative 19 percent to a positive 20 percent. Yes. Well, they S&P thinks their earnings will grow 35 percent versus about 25 percent for technology. So healthcare is one of the laggards this year. No one wanted healthcare. People don't use healthcare. Mm -hmm. They use high technology and, you know, they buy stuff from the Magnificent Seven and nothing else. Well, there are a lot of companies and a lot of sectors out there that have just grossly lagged the market. So, the, you know, the, the thing is, don't give up on Magnificent Seven. It's not going to end on January 1st. It may end February. It may end June. But at some point, that theme will fall out of favor and a new theme will fall into favor. So, you know, keep your eyes open, uh, understand what's going on with the Magnificent Seven, but but keep your eyes open to whatever that next theme may be and try to hop on that bandwagon before it's in its final stages when <laughs> exactly. you still get a lot of run out of it. Yeah, and, then, and, then, and, and what Mike's saying is absolutely true. You know, next year we may see healthcare as just picking a, pick a sector when I, and I think that's a, a, a good idea. The healthcare may well outperform everything else, and and does and and it doesn't mean that technology, you know, the magnificent seven all crash. That's not what he's saying. But they could just underperform. You know, they have a right. year where their performance is maybe flat to mildly up for the year, and healthcare does you know phenomenally well. Um, you know, again, so that's that's the real challenge here. You know, and Mike talking about you know your football teams and stuff. I, I heard yesterday that all future Super Bowls will now be held at Dallas Stadium in Texas because that way nobody will ever have home field advantage again. <laughs> I like it. Any joke against the Cowboys <laughs> is a good joke. <laughs> all right. Be right back after the break. Don't go away.
Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. Coming up January the 27th, we're having a special event. It's called Navigating the Markets in a Presidential Cycle. Greg Vallier is coming to be the keynote presentation. Adam Taggart will be there. Michael Leibowitz, myself, will be spending the morning talking about the economy, the markets, presidential election cycles, what to expect. Tickets are on sale right now. Early bird registration on the website. If you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, click on the banner at the top. Tickets are $99. We've got very limited seating at Hotel Sinesta here in Houston. Uh, you get your early bird special now. Ticket prices will go up as we get into early January. Get your tickets now on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Oh, Red, I declare. I plum miss that candy coffee. Whatever am I going to do? Don't you worry, little darling. We'll watch it again on our YouTube channel. Why, Red? I never. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all of our past presentations from Candid Coffee and Lunch and Learn to special topic discussions and all of our live show recordings preserved for you. Subscribe now to the Real Investment Show YouTube channel or look for the link on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. The tipping thing is getting out of control. They are tip shaming you at checkout. To walk up the counter, you got to order your food. You got to pick up your food. You got to bust it to your table, clean your table, put everything away. And so, you know, when you go to checkout, now it says 10% tip, good, 15% better, <laughs> 20% awesome. The Real Investment Show podcast. And I'm doing all the damn work. This is like self-checkout at the grocery store. It's like, I want some cheerleader to come out and go, Whoa, you did a good job. <laughs> at realinvestmentadvice.com. I should be tipped. <laughs> and now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset your people. Realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell Report, subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. Mike, good news for you. I uh, got you your Christmas present this morning. I renewed your membership to me for the next year, so... It's all paid for. You're the best. <laughs> I knew you'd enjoy that. Every Thursday for 52 weeks. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong with that? I love it. Uh, so, all right, talking about a little bit of this bandwagon effect. Uh, you know, you know, part of this amazing run. I mean, and again, when you take a look at some of these, you know, you know, you go back. Just an example. You just step back to October for a second as, as a good example. The S&P 500 equal weight was negative for the year in October. Um, the ARK Investments, as we said, was negative for the year back in October. And at the end of October, you know, the you know everybody was like, oh, the, you know, the recession's coming, and you know, the the markets are, are, are back into a bear market, and you know, kind of the, the writing's on the wall. And then literally, like somebody flipped a light switch, and 
starting November the 1st, it was off to the races under this assumption that the Federal Reserve is now going to, you know, cut rates and, you know, even and there's even now some commentary coming out about a reversal of QT by the third quarter of next year. And it's it's interesting because the you know what was really causing the markets to sell off in October was the September FOMC meeting where the Fed says, "Hey, yields, you know, uh, you know we're we're nowhere near kind of our inflation target. We're still fighting inflation target." And all of a sudden he makes this comment that yields and the markets are doing their work for them. And all of a sudden the market says, oh, that means they're done hiking rates and, and we've gone to this extreme. And then, of course, in the, the last FOMC meeting, uh, Jerome Powell, you know, kind of reiterated, surprisingly, as, as you and I had discussed, it was a little bit surprising that he really kind of didn't push back on the narrative a bit. And even the projections suggest now three rate cuts next year. The market's now already pricing in six rate cuts for next year. Economic data is beginning to improve on different fronts. Consumer confidence is increasing. I mean, you know, it, it certainly looks to me like the Fed is, is getting themselves into a little bit of a trap here because if we get economic data, now we're not going to get rampant inflation. We're not going to go back up to 9% inflation because we don't have the monetary impulse for that and, the, and, 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 and a shutdown economy. But, I mean, you know, if you have stronger economic activity, inflation, A, is not going to, you know, fall towards 2% next year. And it could even rise a bit, say, to, you know, 3, 3.2, 3.5 next year if you get enough, you know, economic activity going on. You know, it seems like the Fed's in a really tough spot here. Yeah. You know, I think what's interesting, if we look back to last Thursday, we could, the market, except for yesterday, kept rallying, right? Mm -hmm. And it's been rallying ever since, you know, for, since early November based on this notion, and now it's a little more confirmed, that the Fed is getting closer to cutting rates and that the, the idea of raising rates is kind of out the window. But, you know, one way to look at that last meeting was, again, we talked about this, what do they know? And the market, the market can interpret these narratives kind of can come up anyway, and the market interprets things in ways that you may not think possible. And it seems like the interpretation is that the Fed's going to cut rates and they're going to get a nice soft landing because they're going to stimulate the economy and everything's going to be hunky dory, which doesn't really happen in economics. You tend to go from very strong growth to recession to strong growth to recession. And that's just the way it is. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we still have some turbulence ahead of us as the market really digests what's going on at the Fed as the Fed does a hopefully a better job of explaining what they're trying to do. You know, after that Fed meeting, one of the things that we talked about internally was let's see what all the Fed members have to say. They're all going to be speaking over the next week or two. Let's see if they completely walk back everything Powell said or if they agree with him. And they've been very kind of wishy washy. A couple have walked it back. A couple have. They hem and haw. They, uh, I saw one yesterday. Some I forgot who it was, but he said something to the effect of expect the soft landing to be bumpy. Well, the soft landing's not a soft landing if it's bumpy. <laughs> um, so I, I think there's a lot of consternation at the Fed. And that's not necessarily a good thing because I think it means, like a lot of us, that we don't really know what's coming next. We know that the lag effect from those rate hikes has a very, very strong headwind. We keep waiting for that headwind to show up, but we know it's out there. And at some point, historically, it, historically, it's always eventually knocked down the economy. No reason to sp suspect that won't happen this time. But at the same time, economic data continues to stand up very well. The Atlanta Fed GDP is now back up to, I forgot two, what it was, but it's like the upper twos. Yeah, 2.7. Yeah, 2.7, which is very good growth. And, you know, can the Fed really cut rates when the economy is doing well, when unemployment's very close to 50-year lows? So it's a very, this is a market, a, a time, a, fundamentally, that's very tough to try to forecast. It's very easy to make a forecast for growth throughout next year. It's very easy to make a recession growth 
throughout next year, uh, forecast throughout next year. So, you know, I, I suspect that what this is going to lead to is a lot of volatility based on economic data and what the Fed says. If we start seeing an uptick in inflation, I don't think the Fed has any choice but to go back on their words and probably raise rates to show that they mean it. Just going back on their words may not be enough anymore. They've put themselves in a hole where I think they would have to raise rates. And that mm -hmm. would be very upsetting to both the bond and the stock market. And that would easily erase, you know, some of what we've seen since November, if not more. So, you know, I, I think the Fed has set up for set that set us up for a very a very bumpy landing, whether it's soft, hard, who knows what it's going to be, but it's not going to be smooth. I think that that's kind of been taken out of the uh, the <laughs> range of choices. Yeah, but it is interesting, though, when you talk about the lag effect as, as an example, you know, we've been talking about the lag effect for over a year. And, and look, lag effects have a very long lead time. So it's it's not surprising that it hasn't, you know, they haven't shown up more yet. But, you know, you just take a look at some anecdotal indicators that you would expect to really, well, and, and look, let's just go back to some of the more bearish commentary that was out last year. You know, a housing, you know, the, that cr the housing market's going to completely crash and, you know, devastate people. And, and you know, the, the commercial real estate is going to, you know, just completely implode. And there's certainly been some stress in those areas, but it hasn't, you know, the, the, the more dire predictions of economic catastrophe have not surfaced as of yet. And, you know, things are, you know, certainly, you know, prices have come down in homes, but it hasn't been a major crash. In fact, you take, kind of look at, you know, housing prices relative to history, they're still extremely elevated. Um, you know, you take a look at some of the economic data, they certainly came down, leading economic indicators, you know, very negative, 19 months in a row, et cetera, but no recession yet. And, and again, it's not saying that there won't be one, but it's been very interesting that it's taking a whole lot longer uh, for some of the more obvious signs of economic slowdown to show up. And I mean, consumers are still out there spending. We just saw consumer confidence, at, you know, continues to tick up. And and that, that tick up in consumer confidence just isn't, what, just isn't from November. It's actually from October of last year. Consumer confidence has been creeping higher um, as, as the markets go up. So, you know, this this is what makes it really challenging when you when if you listen to some of the more dire headlines out there, it's like, oh, you better be in gold and cash because, it's all about to fall apart. You know, those kind of tail events, you know, they, they happen. They just don't happen very often and can certainly get you on the wrong side of the trade. And this has been a really good example of a year where all the predictions for recession and everything else in 2022 left you out of the markets if, if you were sitting in cash. And Lance, I think home sales is a great example of how hard this is to try to figure out. You know, you said house prices haven't collapsed. They have. They haven't gone any right. They've been flat to slightly higher. Mm -hmm. And how can they be flat to slightly higher when interest rates are so high? Well, what has happened is the housing market has died. There are no house sales, right? right? That the existing home sales are back to lowest levels we've seen. They're below levels that we saw in March of 2020 when everyone was scared to leave their house. That's how 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 that market has dried up. So so the question is why? And the answer is that just as much just as people aren't willing to pay that much for houses mm -hmm. and at a seven, eight percent mortgage, people can't afford to sell their houses either. So you have a glut they, they can't afford to sell it because then they'd have to take on a new mortgage to buy a new house. And it just financially it's hard to make sense out of that. Correct. So so the question is this log jam will break. How does it break? Are there a bunch of buyers in the wings that are willing, when mortgage rates get down to four or five percent, willing to jump in and support house prices, or is there just sent such a pent up supply of houses that it's just going to dwarf the buyers and create, you know, maybe that's when house prices collapse, yeah. quote unquote. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's and that's and that's that's a you know we've talked about that on the show before is that you know that may be one of the big conundrums is that. There's a bunch of people that want to sell their house. They can't, to your point, can't sell their house now because they don't want to take on a 7% mortgage. But as soon as rates get back down to four, there's just this whole glut of existing homeowners that come on the market to sell their house to downsize or whatever other reason they want. And there's not the buyers there for it. So, you know, the crash isn't off the cards, absolutely for sure. It just may not 
be the crash that we think it's going to be, right? So right. we'll, we'll uh, come back from the break where we'll get ready to wrap up the show uh, with Michael Leibowitz. Don't go away. Investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Coming up January the 27th, we're having a special event. It's called Navigating the Markets in a Presidential Cycle. Greg Vallier is coming to be the keynote presentation. Adam Taggart will be there. Michael Leibowitz, myself, will be spending the morning talking about the economy, the markets, presidential election cycles, what to expect. Tickets are on sale right now. Early bird registration on the website. If you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, click on the banner at the top. Tickets are $99. We've got very limited seating at Hotel Sonata. Nesta here in Houston. Uh, you get your early bird special now. Ticket prices will go up as we get into early January. Get your tickets now on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube page has all of our videos ready for your easy access. From three minutes on markets and money to each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show. Or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. You know, one of the uh, there's an interesting story. I'm going to I'm going to sideline Mike here real quick. Uh, Mike, just uh, I'm going to take a left turn without signaling. Uh, but uh, on the break, I was just scanning a couple headlines and a really interesting article jumped out at me on The Wall Street Journal this morning talking about um, burned investors ask, where were the auditors? Uh, court says, who cares? Um let me just read to you from the headlines real quick. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is because this has been a, a, a rather pernicious problem in the markets ever since 1999. And, you know, this is not a problem that's going away anytime soon, but this is a, 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 a this is part of the problem we've had with the financial markets that's been increasing over time and is not getting better. And we saw a, a real surge in activity in 2020 and really, sorry, 2021 and much more speculative, kind of unregulated, so to speak, and, and not entirely unregulated, but you, you'll get my point here in a second. But, you know, we're just letting a lot of stuff go through uh, to give investors more access to more stuff without really letting them be aware of the risk. Here, let me just read to you from this article real quick, and then I'll, I'll make my point. And Mike will certainly want to weigh in on this. Um, one of the country's most influential courts has asked the nation's top securities regulator, that'd be the SEC, for its views on an uncomfortable subject, whether audit reports by the outside accounting firms actually matter. So in other words, you're talking about companies like BDO, Arthur Anderson, et cetera, right? So the, the, your big accounting firms where they're supposed to do the audit of the books and uncover any you know, issues. The court already ruled that, at least in one case, they didn't matter. That case where an insurer overstated profits and an auditor signed off on its books led to an investor lawsuit against the auditor, which was BDO at the time. 
The court then dismissed the case against the auditor. Why? In its ruling, the court said that the audit report was so general that investors shouldn't have relied on it to begin with. Now, how is an, how is a, a, an investor supposed to determine whether or not they rely on an audit report? Now, again, a lot of you weren't around back in the late 90s. Mike, Mike was, and, and you know, there's very few people in today's markets that have ever actually been through a real bear market, whether it's the dot-com crash or the financial crisis. You know, we're 13 years into you know, this market, and nobody's ever seen a real bear market yet. But in 1999, we had a very similar market environment where th nothing seemed to matter. Just, you know, we, we were bringing all kinds of companies public that didn't have any revenue. We were coming up with new metrics for determining, you know, whether or not they're a success, the eyeballs per page, clicks per page, all this other stuff, right? And that was the dot-com bubble. Enron, of course, was the poster child of that era when it all blew up. But it wasn't just Enron. We all remember Enron because it was in all the headlines everywhere for months. But it was Bernie Ebers over at WorldCom, Global Crossing, just a variety of other companies that were complete frauds, right, that were being touted by Wall Street, given buy ratings, by strong buy ratings. You know, you need to buy, don't, you know, Enron, strong buy, right? This is Wall Street. They're supposed to be doing their work. Right. But they don't do the work for you as the retail investor. They do their work for the institutions that pay them the most money. And this is this is becoming a much more pernicious problem, as I said, ever since then. Then financial crisis, we had the rating firms rating mortgage backed securities, triple A, you know, then we, you know, subprime mortgages, triple A. We know how that turned out. And you know, just in 2021, we had we we couldn't get IPOs out the door fast enough, so we came out with with these special purpose acquisition companies, SPACs. And these were companies that didn't even have a business plan. It was just, hey, give me money, and I'll go see if I can find an investment. And you know, those obviously blew up. My my point about this, and Mike, you know, your views on this is that you can't trust when you're investing. You've got to do your own homework. You can't trust the rating agencies. If somebody says a bond is AAA rated or whatever, right? Oh, munis are AAA rated. You know, don't trust them. The rating agencies are always the last one to the table to change a rating. And that goes for stocks as well. Um, you know, be wary of financial reports. There was a recent survey by the Wall Street Journal. They interviewed like 400 different CFOs. Up to 10% of the reports, the, the CFOs of companies admitted that they fudge up to 10% of their reports to make things look better for the reporting period. Why? Because they've got to make a good report. Otherwise, if they don't, their stock price gets crushed and their executive compensation goes down the tube. So they've got to have good reports. We've always got to beat the earnings. And that's why there's this whole huge game on Wall Street that goes on from quarter to quarter and why you have to be as an investor – You've got to do your homework. You've got to dig behind those numbers. And, you know, Mike and I spend a ton of time doing this all the time. And it doesn't mean you're going to be right. But, you know, you've got to really be, take responsibility and not just trust that just because Wall Street tells you something, it's a fair fact. I mean, Mike, you and I have had this discussion more than once, of, you, know, you know, looking at companies and looking at reports of different things and, and kind of scratching our head going, this makes no, this, you know, this really makes no sense why you know this company is a buy rated stock or whatever it is but you know we you know this this is a, a problem that you know the sec has really failed miserably at doing the one job that they were tasked to do following the depression in 1933 which was protect investors from wall street that you know they've become so embedded with wall street now that there's really no difference i would say consistently failing not just failed it, yeah. it's consistent and uh, if I got a second, I wouldn't mind sharing a story from, well, over 20 years ago when I kind of this was the moment when I realized how how, how screwed up the system of Wall Street and auditing was and long many moons ago. I was at Fannie Mae and in the very early 2000s. The SEC was coming after us for allegations that we were not accounting correctly for derivatives. It was called the ruling. The one of the rules that they were going against was FASB 133, which was derivatives pricing and hedging. And uh, you know, 
first of all, the rule, it's not like it, it's kind of like the speed limit. The speed limit may be 55, but you can go 60 sometimes. Other places you could go 70. You can go below the speed limit. There's really even though it says it's 55, there's no hard limit. FASB rules are even worse. They just give you a general notion of what you're how you're supposed to report something. And there's many different ways to do it. The IRS is a little bit like this, too. There are many different interpretations of accounting rules. So I remember this vividly. We're in a conference room. It's like the top people at Fannie Mae and the top five or six of the there. I think at the time there were seven auditing firms, six mm -hmm. big auditing firms yeah, like Pete six. Marwick and right. Um, the big six. And they each had head honchos there. The person who was at the firm who was responsible for derivatives and someone, maybe not the CEO, but someone very high up accompanying them. And we went around the table and said, how should we be doing this? You know, we're being accused of doing it wrong. We want to do it right. This was kind of a plan a planning meeting on how to do it going forward. What do we do going forward? We got six different answers on what they thought was acceptable. So as a company, even if you're trying to do the right thing, it can be misinterpreted as the wrong thing because a lot of the rules are kind of very vague. And then these auditing firms, which you're paying, want to tell you what you want to hear. What's the easiest? What's the most profitable way to, to report according to this rule or that rule? Mm -hmm. And it was in that moment where I, I realized the whole system is, is of auditing and Wall Street and, and the way that they try to portray everything to the public is just wrong. And it's it's what's in their best interest, right? Like Lance, you said, how many AAA bonds went, went bankrupt <laughs> in 2007, 2008? It's right. unbelievable that something rated AAA, which is on par with the US government and one or two companies at this point could go bankrupt that quickly. Right. Right. And, and when you go, go watch the big short, right? It's a great movie. The book is even better, but either way, it shows you how much fraud there was in the system in, in not just wall street, but all those firms that support wall street, the rating agencies, the auditors, the whole nine yards, they just turn a blind eye because they're focused on their profits and ultimately their paychecks. Well, and, 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 and the problem to your, to what you're saying, Mike, is this revolving door that exists between the auditors and Wall Street. And, you know, mm -hmm. one of my I, I've I've, you know, prognosticated for a long time that, you know, if you're going to solve the problem between Wall Street and the SEC, if you want real oversight, you got to shut that door. If you go to work for the SEC, you can't go work for a public company for 10 years after you leave the SEC. Um, right. Because, again, you know, these guys go to the SEC to get the experience to then go to work for Goldman Sachs or whoever it is to okay. make a million dollars a year as their chief compliance officer, right. et cetera. This is, you know, the SEC is a stepping stone. Well, they're, they're, if that's the case, they're certainly not going to, you know, regulate, you know, these big firms because they won't get hired come down the road. I mean, I, I remember, you know, remember that back in, I think it was, you know, 2010, 2011, there was the big push on trying to regulate high speed trading and algorithm, you know, these algorithm firms. And right, right in the middle of that investigation, the head of the SEC that's heading up that investigation of these high speed trading firms quits her job and goes to work for the one firm they were auditing. <laughs> so, right. of course, nothing ever came from it. Right. 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 Here in D.C., I have neighbors like I've heard these stories where these like someone will go from a really high paying job at a law firm to go work for some agency in the government. And you know, be like, why would you do that? You're taking a massive pay cut because they're going to do it for two years. And when they come back out on the other side, they're going to make even more than they were making because they have all the connections. At Absolutely. That point. Mike, thank you so much. Uh, Mike and I are done for the year. Uh, we want to wish you a very Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year. And we'll be back at the beginning of January with our next live shows. Mike will join me in, on Thursday, the first Thursday of, of the new year. We'll be here for you. But have a blessed and happy, very safe, Merry Christmas, a happy new year. And we can't you know, wish you any more to have a prosperous new year next year. We'll see you soon.